He has a very, very broad research program in um, thermal and electrocatalysis um, for sustainable energy processes um, with um, a major interest in mechanistic understanding. Um, and so with that, uh, I'd like to just give Binjun the mic. So if... Hello, could you hear me? And so, great. So we're really excited to have you. All right, thank you very much for, for your introduction and also the invitation. Uh, just to confirm, can everybody hear me and then see my, uh, see my cursor? Uh, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And I think, yeah, all the participants can also, yeah. All right, fantastic. So thanks for the uh, introduction and also the invitation. And uh, good afternoon, good morning, and good evening, depending on where you are. And uh, uh, it's an honor and a, a, a real pleasure to speak to such a diverse group of, and also uh, people, and also technically sophisticated researchers in electric catalysis. And, uh, uh, I work at the University of Delaware and then on the East Coast of the United States, we are still in the process of reopening and that's why I'm still working from home. And uh, uh, I have to apologize in advance if this talk is interrupted by my son bursting into this room or screaming from downstairs and uh, he was told to be quiet and let's see how, how far my father authority goes on a three-year-old, right? All right, today I'm gonna to talk about uh, our recent efforts in understanding interfacial electrocatalytic processes and from the perspective of in situ operando characterizations. And since this is a very diverse uh, group of uh, people, I would like to first give a uh, uh, overview of the research program I have at Delaware. And then we're a group of scientists and engineers interested in developing catalytic processes of converting uh, uh, abundant and uh, inexpensive feedstocks into uh, more valuable and uh, more valuable and uh, uh, products in a products in a renewable and uh, energetically or energy efficient way. And uh, intellectually, we're interested in understanding how catalytic reactions occur at the interface between a solid catalyst and a uh, fluid phase, be it gaseous, be it liquid. And uh, in our research, we frequently uh, employ and uh, in many cases uh, develop interfacial specific, uh, specific spectroscopic techniques to ar arrive at the molecular level understanding we strive for. And uh, more recently, we have started, uh, we have forayed into the area of catalytic material synthesis and, and characterization because this is just an integral part of the catalysis research. And uh, in terms of the area, we have spent quite a bit of time on biomass upgrading. Uh, as you can see from the left to right, the reactant to product, we're basically trying to selectively remove oxygen containing groups like those uh, red spheres represent oxygen. And then we have also uh, worked on and are working on uh, more engineering heavy pro projects like uh, process intensification for methane dehydrometrization to liquid uh, aromatics and also uh, chemical looping scheme uh, to enable the direct air capture of CO2. And about half my group is working on electrocatalysis, and which will be the, the main topic today. And then we worked on reduction of CO, CO2, nitrogen, and the oxidation of hydrogen for the application, either uh, electrolyzers uh, or the uh, or fuel cells. And today I'm going to uh, focus on the reduction part, and then that will be the electrochemical reduction of CO2 and CO, and then uh, very short, very briefly towards the end of nitrogen. And uh, uh, my assumption or my understanding is that the audience here is uh, technically sophisticated in terms of the electrocatalysis. And then so that I'm gonna cut out, cut out most of the motivational slides I typically include in my uh, public talks. And I hope that everyone in the audience uh, is convinced the climate change is real. And then we as scientists, engineers, and then researchers have the responsibility to develop uh, more energy efficient and renewable processes. And then all the reactions I'm gonna talk about uh, is a part of this, uh, a component of this effort. And then for today's talk, I'm gonna keep it really fundamental. And uh, uh, so the first general topic will be the electrochemical CO2 and the CO reduction on copper. And uh, as you can see from the title, I'm gonna to touch on three uh, topics, surface speciation, cation anion effect, and the reaction mechanism. Right off the bat, 
you can tell uh, I'm being overly ambitious. And uh, uh, so I'm gonna just touch upon uh, several aspects of these broad and uh, uh, deep topics. So copper speci uh, speciation in these reactions. So why do we care about it? And uh, at the risk of stating the obvious to this audience that copper is the only monometallic metal surface, uh, metallic surface capable of converting CO2 and CO into valuable multi-carbon products at any appreciable selectivity and uh, uh, primarily attributable to its uh, kind of unique uh, absorption energy of CO. And, and copper surface is not just one surface. Copper surface can be prepared by different methods and they're resulting in quite different performances. And uh, let me give you just one example. So polycrystalline copper, this is the, the copper that uh, most widely used. And then we can uh, buy those samples readily from vendors like Sigma Aldrich. And in COR or CO reduction reaction, uh, the potential needed to produce like appreciable amount of uh, multi-carbon products here, uh, those are ethanol and uh, propanol and the acetate ethylene is around the 0.5, negative 0.5 volt versus RIG. And uh, another type of copper, a very special type of copper and oxide derived copper developed by uh, Cannon's group at uh, Stanford University. And in this talk, I refer to uh, oxide derived copper as OD copper. And uh, this type of OD copper has the ability to mediate the same type of reaction or same type of pathway at a much lower over potential or less negative potential. As you can see that ethanol and acetate are produced at negative 0.3 volts. So this 200 millivolts uh, difference is a big deal in electric fatality. And the clear question is, what makes OD copper so special? And uh, there are multiple uh, hypotheses already in the, uh, in the literature. So the first is proposed by Cannon, uh, Cannon School, and then they attribute the unique reactivity uh, to the green boundary sites and the strong uh, steel binding uh, sites, which is certainly plausible. And the second is a uh, second group school of thought regards OD copper to be nothing more than roughened copper, right? And OD copper, by the way, is uh, basically prepared by the uh, copper surface that has undergone redox cycles. And the third group of thought is that there are certain species, oxygen containing species, that say uh, Cu plus or subsurface oxygen. So right off the bat, I consider the second hypothesis to be less likely because the surface roughness or surface area should only uh, impact, let's say the rate, not let's say the onset potential or, uh, or the product distribution. But that still leaves us at least the two very plausible hypotheses, right? So let's, Take a look at this one first, because this basically uh, is a hypothesis about the surface speciation. So we decided to use the surface enhanced aroma to look at the copper speciation uh, at reaction conditions. This is critical because copper is a metal that's very easily oxidized. For example, if you have a piece of copper that's exposed to the ambient condition in any, at any uh, appreciable duration, you form probably a copper surface native oxide. So that in order to understand the, the state of copper surface under reaction, we have to subject this copper surface to the reducing conditions. And the uh, Raman spectroscopy is one of the ways we can do that. And then here I show you a, uh, a set of spectra. And uh, this is uh, the cell we use. And, uh, uh, and then when the sample is uh, placed here and, uh, uh, and then it's placed uh, on the microscope. So this uh, in situ Raman typically is conducted in a confocal microscope uh, configuration. And uh, on the left side, uh, this spectra, this is on the electrode of copper foil. This is a copper foil I believe we purchased from Sigma Aldrich. Other than the peak uh, corresponding to the sulfate that, do, uh, that is in the electrolyte, we don't see much features, which is kind of disappointing. And then we realized that uh, although copper itself is able to uh, enable surface enhancement of the Raman signal, we still need the surface roughness. And then one way to get around this challenge is by using a technique developed by uh, uh, Tian's group uh, in Xiamen University. And uh, basically introducing those particles that are surface enhancing. And those particles uh, are gold nanoparticles which provides the surface enhancement covered by or coated by a layer of silica to make sure they're chemically inert. So this is uh, our image. 
SEM image. This is copper foil before and after the decoration. As you can see that we have a bunch of those. And those, the result is quite drastic, right? So with those shyness particles, or so this is the, the shorthand, uh, we see uh, at OCP, the open circuit potential, right off the bat, we see the uh, oxide, native oxide of copper foil, as expected. As we go down the potential, we see that uh, there are many peaks, right? And uh, an important uh, take-home message is that those, there are peaks even at a very low potential, very negative potential, uh, negative 0.8. And uh, uh, so those peaks correspond to either the uh, oxygen absorbed on copper or a mixed phase of copper oxide and hydroxide, okay? And uh, we also conducted a similar experiment in, uh, on many different copper surfaces, uh, copper micron, uh, micron particles, uh, nanoparticles. I believe these two we purchased directly from Sigma Aldrich and the chemically deposited copper on silicon. This is important because this is also used for the IR study that I'm gonna talk about later. And this is the OD copper prepared by the electrochemical uh, oxidation and reduction of the copper. And uh, this slide goes against all the advice I gave to my students in terms of presentation because too many spectra shows up at a, show up at the same time. But the, here the, the message I would like to uh, highlight is that the speciation of all the copper surface I look, we looked at, despite their different morphology, they are very similar, right? And uh, you can take my word for it and uh, you can take a look at our publication to be sure that all those peaks appear at about the same potential and then this, about the same speciation, right? And uh, that is uh, either oxygen as rubbed on copper or the mixed phase. And then we, we took a look at the uh, uh, CORR reaction in batch and on all of these uh, metals we looked at. And uh, here, different colors uh, corresponds to different metals. And then the majority is still hydrogen because it's a batch cell. And uh, uh, we have ethylene, ethane, uh, ethanol, and propanol. And uh, the message I would like to highlight here is that, or the information, is that uh, the performance are very different on different copper. However, their speciation at the reaction conditions is very similar. And this is also the case when we conduct uh, the COR in a flow cell in my collaborator and my colleague, Dr. Song Jiao's lab. And uh, this is copper micron particle, nanoparticle, and OD copper. And as you can see that without uh, getting into too much detail, the product distribution and the rates are very different on these, uh, on these uh, uh, micron and nano structures of copper. So the conclusion we drew is that Although the ox oxygen containing species, they do exist under reaction conditions. And then these species do not appear to directly contribute to the CC coupling. And here uh, I am being careful about my wording here. That is, do not directly contribute because we don't know whether they contribute in any indirect way. So uh, then the question persists, what makes copper so, OD copper so special, right? So, this is another uh, piece of recent work uh, on this topic from my group. We used a different uh, in surface enhancing method called surface enhanced IR spectroscopy or CRS. And then this is a cell we developed that was forced convection. Basically it's a, a CRS cell with the crystal on the side and then we can have a, a stirring here. And uh, for those of you who are not very uh, familiar with this technique, we have a, a silicon crystal ATR crystal, and then we deposit the metal of interest, in this case will be copper on top, and then this is either chemically deposited copper or OD copper, right? And uh, so this is the, the main result of this, uh, this work. So when we use chemically deposited copper, which is very similar to, let's say, copper micron particle or copper uh, polycrystalline copper, we primarily see two peaks of CO absorption at reaction conditions. This is at negative 0.4 volt and in phase. And then uh, the higher wave number band uh, typically is attributed to the linearly bounded CO on the step sites and then the lower wave number band is on the terra sites. And then when we conducted the same experiment on OD copper on gold, and then the reason we have to use a gold surface is that the gold surface is a surface enhancing agent, right? And uh, the signal is much lower because the uh, OD copper particles are massive. Those are micron-sized particles. And if I can go back, 
So the surface enhancement effect only lasts about t uh, five to 10 nanometers. So we are only sampling a very small section of the sample. So the signal is low. But we see this band at 2050, 2058 wave number that is absent in uh, the chemically deposited copper. And in this experiment, because we introduced OD copper on the gold uh, substrate, so we might have created a new type of site that could be responsible for this new band. That would be the gold copper uh, interface, right? So in order to test this hypothesis, we also uh, conducted a control experiment in which the, we introduced the copper micron particles and just like the ones used in the uh, slides uh, before on gold so that we expect to create the same type of interfacial sites if they exist. As it turns out, this band is missing. And uh, uh, we also conducted experimental uh, uh, reactivity studies on these samples. And because we have a uh, cell, spectroscopic cell with forced uh, convection, we can actually uh, detect or quantify products directly uh, in the solution electrolyte of the uh, electrochemical or spectroscopic uh, experiments. And then this will be in this uh, light yellow uh, bars. As you can see that we can see quite a bit of ethanol, one propanol and acetate. And then we do not see any gaseous products because in the spectroscopic experiment, we have to keep the cell purging. And then those product distribution are very similar to OD copper, either supported on carbon or supported on gold in the reactivity cell, showing that our spectroscopic uh, cell is able to reproduce the reactivity cells. And then this is a true upper round of spectroscopic experiment. And uh, so for the copper micron particles and then chem chemically deposited copper, you don't see any bars here or barely any bars here, showing that they are very different in reactivity at negative point four volt, right? At negative point four volt, only OD copper is able to produce those products. And uh, uh, we, we believe that this 2058 band holds the key. And then we looked into the literature and then we found that the Hori, the great Hori, more than 20 years ago, did a set of experiments and then showed that 2056 was the wave number of CO absorbed on uh, the surface at a comparable potential. This is 0 0.39, negative 0.39 volt versus RHG. And then what we have is negative 0.4. As you can see that those numbers are basically indistinguishable. And then we believe that the, uh, the preferential exposure of the 111 or 111 like facet on copper is likely to cause for the distinct activity in the COR. And uh, this is uh, consistent with many experimental and computational study. And here I cite one of uh, Karen's paper with Hao Tian Wang, uh, and then also showing that the uh, copper 100 has favors the CC copper. All right. So uh, here's uh, the, the first the small section and the, the take home message is not all observed species are involved in catalysis, despite the tendency of uh, experimentalists, like the, the excitement that we observe something, right? And then certainly this was not a message or uh, the hypothesis we had in mind when we started the project. And at the same time, we don't know about the hidden roles of the, let's say, the mixed phase, copper oxide and hydroxide, because what if they exist and then they stabilize at this specific surface morphology and the types of copper sites that enable the, uh, the COR at low level potential? So this is the open question. And uh, I personally don't believe that the, the copper, OD copper has a pristine environment of copper 100, right? So it, it must be in my mind, a lot of copper 100 like uh, sites. And how do the differences in the microenvironment around those sites impact the activity and the product distribution? I feel like this is still a topic that deserves further investigation. All right, let's move on to the second subtopic and the cation anion effect. And then it's just fitting to talk about this topic here because Karen uh, is a leading uh, scholar in, uh, in this area and uh, many of the uh, or the, the key hypothesis in this area has been proposed by Karen and, and Alex Bell. And then here I cited two papers and then uh, on the cation effect and then uh, a very important hypothesis that the cation could, the size of the cation or the nature of the cation could impact on the interfacial electrical strength, uh, field strength. And because the size of the, the cations are different. And another uh, hypothesis uh, put forward by uh, Alex Bell and co-workers uh, 
hypothesizes that uh, different alkaline metal cations due to their different properties can impact on the surface uh, interfacial pKa and the interfacial pH. And in CO2RR, this could boost the concentration of CO2 around uh, the electrode. And an anion effect, and in the context of CO2 and COR, it's basically a pH effect because uh, hydroxide is expected to be, or is proposed to be the most influential uh, anion. So let's take a look at the anion effect first because these two are connected. So here uh, I'm citing another paper Karen's involved. I believe this is a paper from a Jaramillo school. And uh, here is a direct quote from this paper. And then the rate determining steps of C2 plus pathways are independent of pH on absolute potential scale, which is basically illustrated here. If we plot, uh, if one plot that are the products from CO2 are the solid ones and the CO are those uh, uh, open ones together on an absolute potential scale, they kind of overlap extensively, okay? And this is also consistent with our uh, recent experiment in which we conducted a set of experiments. And then this is in collaboration with uh, Qi Lu's group at, uh, uh, at the Tsinghua University. So we conducted a set of experiments in which uh, the top trace is basically the concentration of just sodium hydroxide. The bottom trace is the same sodium cation concentration, but the kept the uh, OH con uh, hydroxide concentration 0.1 molar, right? And uh, these experiments were conducted at negative 0.7 versus uh, volt RHE. As you can see that the blue is clearly higher than uh, red and then uh, the Y axis is the COR partial current density. Uh, so here it appears that the uh, hydroxide has an impact. However, if we conduct a set of, another set of similar experiments in which we have everything at 1.5, negative 1.5 volt versus SH on absolute energy scale, uh, potential scale, and uh, again, keep the concentration of sodium constant, but vary the concentration of hydroxide. As you can see that there's not much change. Right. And then there are slight changes. This is on the log scale, but on the grand scale. Uh, uh, so these are quite independent of the hydroxide concentration. So consistent with the Hermio work, the pH effect on the COR or CO2R could be better understood as a result of the choice of the potential scale. And of course, this insight is informed by the mechanistic understanding that the, CO, uh, the CC coupling occurs uh, in a, in a pH independent fashion. And uh, in this work, we have, we further uh, investigated the impact of concentration of cations. So here, I would like to uh, focus on all the experiments uh, in red boxes. And basically those are, uh, the first two will be the experiments conducted at the same SDG potential at 0.1 molar hydro sodium hydroxide. And then the second the red is 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide plus 0.9 molar of sodium perchlorate. So basically the same pH, but different concentration of cation. So this is dark gray and red. So dark gray and red, ethylene, and acetate, ethanol, and then propanol. You see that the impact of the concentration of cation or sodium cation in this case uh, is quite substantial on the product distribution and the rates. And uh, let's compare the, the second here row and then the, uh, the last one. So this is point, uh, one molar sodium hydroxide. And then the difference between the red and then let's say brown will be the same concentration of sodium, but different concentrations of hydroxide. So this is red and brown, red and brown. And we can see that they are much closer so that we reach the conclusion that the formation rates increases by the sodium concentration, not as much impacted by the hydroxide, okay? And then now I'd like to introduce a, a technical concept or uh, that is stock tuning rate. Stock tuning rate is basically, well stock tuning effect is basically the, in the uh, vibrational spectroscopy and uh, which corresponds to the dipole moment in this case, uh, in the IR experiment. And then the peak position changes the potential because the interfacial uh, electric field strength uh, changes as we change the potential. And uh, here is illustrated here, uh, the CO absorption band on copper at different potentials. So those are the potentials. And the stock tuning rate is basically defined as the peak shift divided by uh, the potential shift in the unit of wave number per volt. And uh, 
Stock tuning rate is an experimental measure of the interfacial field strength in the sense that how fast the peak shifts. And uh, here, uh, when we conducted the set experiment, we assume, or at least we hypothesize that as we introduce more higher, higher concentration of cations, and then the interfacial uh, electric field strength must increase so that it impacts the, the rate of the reaction. To our surprise, when we conducted a set experiment, and uh, uh, the first is in uh, 0.1 molar hydroxide, sodium hydroxide, the second is 0.1 molar sodium hydroxide plus 0.9, uh, 0.4 molar sodium perchlorate and 0.9 molar, basically the same pH, but different concentrations of sodium. The stock tuning rates are very similar from 30 to 33. And I'm not willing to say that these are different. And as a matter of fact, the first has the higher uh, stock tuning rate. Uh, if, we can, uh, if we can resolve uh, uh, like several or uh, one, uh, one volume number per volt, which we don't think, I don't think so. So let's say that these are the same, which means that the cation concentration impacts CORR without significantly changing the interfacial field strength, which kind of goes against the, uh, the field strength hypothesis. However, I would say that this is not uh, something that's, uh, this conclusion cannot be made at this point because another experiment we did is that we drastically changed the nature or identity of the cations. In this case, uh, we started with one molar sodium hydroxide and then by introducing and then introducing higher and higher concentration of the crown ether. Crown ether, so this is a concept of the host gas chemistry that crown ether is very effective in chelating uh, a specific type of uh, cations. In this case, the 15 crown five is very selective for sodium cations. And basically you see that when we int introduce 0 0.1, 0 0.5 and then one molar crown ether, we basically change it different fraction or increasing fraction of sodium into the chelated sodium. And this is the reactivity results. So this is uh, the white dots are the uh, COR uh, partial current density. It goes down by quite a bit. I would say that maybe by more than a factor of three. And then also the selectivity towards the COR product, those colored bars uh, also goes down. The selectivity also shifts to HER, right? And uh, uh, conceptually here, uh, in a, uh, schematically, what we have done is that without the chelation or the crown, so the sodium cation, those like blue spheres are hydrated, right? And then they have hydration shells and then they're sitting uh, some distance away from the surface, which is covered by CO, schematically shown here. So, and because the, the size is relatively small so that the, the uh, electric field strength is stronger. And as they become more and more chelated and uh, the crown ether is much bigger than hydration shell so that they have to, the cation, the bulky cation has to stay a bit further away from the surface so that the electric field strength should be lower, right? And this is exactly what we observe. And then when we conducted the experiments like uh, determining the um, stock tuning rate of this and uh, this case, it decreases from uh, without Crown 33 to with crown 24, uh, with number per volt, shows that a weakening interfacial field strength could be correlated with uh, the, the reactivity study. And another interesting result we had is that, so in this uh, set of reactivity studies, on the left, we have 0.5 molar sodium uh, hydroxide. On the right, we have 0.5 molar sodium hydroxide plus 0.5 molar chelated sodium hydroxide. And as you can see that we still have much lower, maybe uh, suppressed by a factor two in terms of the COR activity and then the selectivity towards COR also goes down. Showing that the same concentration of sodium cation, free sodium cation is not a guarantee that the reactivity will be the same. And then it seems like a different type of, the presence of a different kind of cation is competing uh, in terms of influencing the, uh, the surface reactivity. Okay, so this is a uh, uh, small summary. The pH effect on the CO2R or COR can be resolved via the mechanistic insight that is the limiting step in CC coupling is pH independent. And uh, two open questions uh, are, are there both a electric field dependent or electric field component and a non-electric field component in the cation effect 
uh, on the individual electrical catalytic processes. And uh, how do different cations compete in interacting with electro surface? And then what are the kind of guidelines in understanding or in predicting the, the competition process? Okay, so let's uh, switch gears a bit and uh, move on to the third subtopic on the COR. And this will be the reaction mechanism. And here I'm gonna show you uh, the same uh, plots I showed you before. As I do, as I consider that these, uh, this message is, is key to understanding uh, many of the CC coupling products uh, processes. However, uh, not as much research is devoted on the CC coupling beyond C2 products. Let's say that the most commonly detected C3 product is one propanol. How does that work? And uh, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, motivation in terms of uh, forming higher or C, uh, higher than C2 uh, uh, products from COR and CO2R. And here uh, I took this uh, plot from a chemical reviews paper from DTU, from uh, Trukendox Group, and it's showing that the propanol has a higher market price per ton of carbon, right? And uh, when we go through the literature that uh, very few work is dedicated to the mechanistic understanding of that. And then this is one of the few we found uh, from Alex Bell's group and then uh, in which they use uh, the differential electrochemical uh, mass spectrometry, a technique very sensitive to the reactive intermediates at low concentration. They identified acetaldehyde, and then they proposed that acetaldehyde is the intermediate to uh, the end propanol. And uh, uh, we consider that this is a very strong indication, but it is not a, a foolproof uh, piece of evidence showing that uh, Acetaldehyde is indeed an intermediate because just because something exists doesn't mean that uh, it has an impact, just like the, the ox oxygen containing species in the first part of the talk. So we decided to, uh, to test this hypothesis, right? And then uh, in this case, we're uh, only using reactivity studies and uh, we by introducing acetaldehyde into the reactivity cell. And as another paper by Trukendorf's group shows that the chemistry of acetaldehyde in alkaline kind of conditions is quite complex. There are many uh, side reactions, the Kanzaro reaction, the auto condensation, the Peschenko reaction. But luckily, all of these reactions, they do not form, or none of these reactions form a C3 product, so that we can still uh, uh, differentiate those with uh, the NMR. And then, so for the rest part of this, uh, this segment, we're just having a lot of fun or a lot of nightmares, depending on your perspective, with NMR. And uh, the first, what we want to understand is how whether acetaldehyde couples with CO. And if it does, how does it do it, right? And uh, in this case, we are generating a lot of puzzle pieces, mechanistic puzzle pieces with C12, C13 uh, labeled experiments. In this case, we introduced, we conducted the co-electrolysis either with C12 or C13, CO. And in the control experiment, we, uh, it's just C12, COR, we produce, uh, Ethanol. So this is the hydrogen or proton connected to carbon next to hydroxide, the uh, quartet. And then this is uh, the same uh, proton in propanol, the triplet. And uh, when we conduct the same experiment in C3, uh, C13 uh, CO, and due to the C13 uh, carbon and then uh, proton coupling, both peaks, both set of peaks split. You see that this uh, quartet split into these two, and then this triplet splits into these two, okay? And then a similar uh, split is uh, observed uh, in the methyl group, right? As you can see that this triplet uh, splits into the, the two groups. And then with these, we can actually identify that uh, when we conducted the co-electrolysis, which type of carbon in which, condi uh, in which position? So on the left, we show that, we show that at, uh, during the co-electrolysis, we still form this group. That, that is the C13 carbon right next to oxygen. However, we do not see this triplet uh, peaks. That is the C12 right next to oxygen. And on the right, we see both the, these groups, right? The C13 in the metal group, 
and then the C12 in the metal group, those will present as uh, the shoulders. So that's, let's put together all the puzzle pieces with the C12, C13. So these are the two uh, observations we've made. So on the oxygen, uh, on the carbon next to oxygen, we only see C13 and on the uh, carbon next to, or uh, in the metal group, we see both, right, C12, C13. And then these can be rationalized uh, by the following arguments. So in the co-electrolysis, we have two parallel reactions. The first is self-coupling of CO. And in the case of C13CO, we just basically form everything C13, right, labeled. And another is cross-coupling, that is cross-coupling between the acetaldehyde and the label C13. And in this case, C13 always ends up in uh, the position right next to oxygen because we never see C12 in this carbon position, okay? Because you see here, since uh, the C13 is labeled and everything's labeled, right? So this is the first key piece of mechanistic information. And then a second aspect we need to figure out in terms of the coupling is that which carbon does CO couple to in acetaldehyde? Here I color coded, right? One is black, one is gray. And then let's say that if it couples to the gray carbon, and then what we form is something like this, right? Uh, the uh, CD3 uh, group is preserved. And then in NMR, we are expecting that the, the triplet will be missing. And uh, you see that it has one D, however, the D here is uh, replaced by H. That's because the you know, acetaldehyde, the carbonyl hydrogen or deuterium is very active. It scrambles with the proton in water very quickly. And uh, let's say that if this carbon or CO couples with a metal carbon and then forms something like this, and then notice that the, uh, the gray and then the black carbon uh, change the position here, right? And here we have this CD2, right? And then we have the metal group here will be the CH. Again, that's because the D is very active. And in this case, we will be expecting a quintet, okay? So then we can actually uh, take a look at the results to see that which hypothesis is right. And then we only see triplets for the metal group, meaning that there's no quintet. And then the CO couples with this carbon, the carbonyl carbon, which sort of makes sense because carbonyl carbon is more active. And uh, so th these two sets of uh, two sets uh, of spectra corresponds to the hydrogen or the proton uh, connected to the carbon right next to the hydroxide or in the metal group. And then the first uh, set of experiments, uh, first experiment contains no acetaldehyde. You see that the ratio of these two peaks expected as uh, three to two, well, 1.5, right? So this is higher, this is lower because we have three hydrogen or three protons in metal group, two protons here. As we increase the concentration of acetaldehyde, as you can see that these values or the peak areas becomes more consistent. So I plot the results here. So this is the bottom axis is the concentration of the deuterated acetaldehyde. And then the, this is the peak ratio of the methyl versus the hydroxy methyl, methylene group. Without any uh, acetaldehyde is around 1.5 with increasing amount of acetaldehyde D4, this peak ratio at 40 millimole of acetaldehyde decreases to about one, which can be rationalized by forming an increasing amount of CD3 uh, uh, propanol, right? And, and then this part is missing, so that it drags down the overall rate peak ratio. And with this insight, we can actually back out the fraction of uh, propanol produced through the cross coupling uh, pathway versus the self coupling pathway. And this is the result. So the bar, uh, the height of the bar shows the overall amount. As you can see, that the uh, the, uh, as we increase the concentration of acetaldehyde, the overall amount of propanol form actually goes down. And uh, this in part is because we conduct those experiments with a uh, fixed uh, amount of charge and then uh, introducing acetaldehyde basically gives a lot of motivation in terms of uh, using the electrons to reduce the acetaldehyde to ethanol. But the one surprising thing is that even when we introduce as high as 40 millimole of uh, acetaldehyde, only about 36% of the propanol formed is through the cross coupling. And if acetaldehyde were the necessary intermediate in this pathway, in the formation of propanol, 
we would expect the cross coupling to be dominant because in COR, the concentration of the, or the solubility of CO is in aqueous electrolyte is about 0.1 millimole. And uh, the concentration of the self coupling or the acetaldehyde formed from self coupling of CO is even lower. So, whatever the concentration we introduce should overwhelm uh, the acetaldehyde produced by CO. So that if CO couples with acetaldehyde, it should couple overwhelmingly with acetaldehyde we introduce. This is not the case. Okay? And also, a same argument can be made for all the hydrogenated derivatives of the acetaldehyde as the species being coupled with CO. Why is that? Because if a hydrogenated derivative of acetaldehyde is a species that couples with CO, then this species should also be dominant, dominated by the amount of uh, acetaldehyde we introduce, because we introduce more acetaldehyde and more of those hydrogenated species will be from uh, what we introduce rather than produce uh, on the surface, right? So this is not the case. So based on these arguments, we propose that this methyl carbonyl is the intermediate that couples with CO for the reason that it is a dehydrogenated derivative. That is, when the acetaldehyde dissociated and absorbed on the surface, it forms this. And as you can see that the acetaldehyde and the methyl carbonyl, uh, methyl carbonyl loses one hydrogen. So this is a dehydrogenation reaction and a reducing condition, which is thermodynamically not favorable. And then this could explain why this pathway is not favorable. And do we have concrete proof that this is exactly the structure? No, we don't. And, but we do believe that this is the most likely intermediate. So this is the, uh, uh, a summary of this part. The coupling between CO and an acetaldehyde is not a major pathway in the production of one propanol. And acetaldehyde does not directly participate in CC coupling. However, it's dehydrogenated intermediate could. And then we still don't know what is the structure of the intermediate that directly couples with CO. All right. So let's switch gears. And then this part I promise will be relatively short and then electrochemical reduction of C, uh, nitrogen. So this is a uh, interesting and a sort of contra controversial field or topic. So the overall motivation for electrochemical nitrogen reduction for ammonia produ production is to replace the energy and then carbon intensive Haber-Bosch process. And then with something that's green and then distributed like the uh, ENR. And it's interesting that depending on which paper you read, you could uh, leave with the impression that this, the ENR has been solved. We have very uh, active and uh, selective catalyst or uh, this field is totally doomed and uh, there's no hope at all. And uh, uh, for the rest of five minutes, I'm certainly not gonna wade into this controversy and I'm gonna keep it really fundamental and uh, in, in terms of the catalysis research. So I would like to uh, first mention that uh, we discovered that the transition metal nitrides uh, are reasonably active and selective for this reaction. And then we looked at uh, chromium nitride and vanadium nitride. And then here I show the results of vanadium nitride and uh, we conduct all the reactivity studies in the membrane electrode assembly configuration, which boosts the, the rate of production. As you can see that we can see, uh, we can basically uh, produce about two, three times 10 to minus 10 mole per second per square centimeter of uh, ammonia, uh, which is not a lot, but it's something. And then the Faraday efficiency is around the five to six uh, percent. Uh, I'm in no way claiming that this is one of the best because it is not based on the public uh, published literature. And, uh, but we did do a quite extended react, uh, stability test because we uh, use MEA, it's a bit easier. And then we can sustain the, a decent steady state uh, activity for more than 100 hours. And then there is quite a steep deactivation in the initial four hours by a factor of three uh, of both the reactivity and the Faraday coefficient. But I do believe that we made quite a bit of ammonia. We made about four milligrams, which is not a lot, but it's more than 10 times of the uh, nitrogen contained in our catalyst. And uh, I haven't been keeping up to date with all the current NNR literature, but I believe this is still one of the highest absolute amount of ammonia made in this uh, in ENR. Uh, we also uh, did the now obligatory the nitrogen 15 experiment, and then we show that on um, uh, vanadium nitride 
and uh, we both form nitrogen fifteen and uh, fourteen ammonium, right? And uh, through uh, in situ uh, in situ uh, XAS experiment, we identified the pre edge band of the vanadium uh, edge corresponding to the uh, oxynitrite, and then this goes down with the reactivity, and then we identify this as active phase. So all of these are set up for the interesting part I'm going to talk about uh, in the next few slides. So we want to understand what determines, how to determine the density of active sites before and then after initial activation, and uh, how to obtain reliable turnover frequencies for the initial and the steady state active sites. So turnover frequency is a concept that ingrained in the thermal catalysis, but it is relatively foreign in electrocatalysis. And then this is the only way, or maybe the best way to really assess the intrinsic activity of a active site. So we would like to take a, take a, give it a try to, on this system. So we decided to make the NMR experiment with 14 and 15 ammonium more quantitative. As a matter of fact, we can do that. Uh, and then the idea is that we, when we have vanadium nitride nanoparticles, right, and then only surface, uh, surface nitrogen atoms are accessible and can be active sites. And then because we know that the surface nitrogen participates in the reaction in the Mars van Kraveling mechanism, and if we conduct the reaction under nitrogen 15 atmosphere for long enough, we can exchange all the active nitrogen 14 with nitrogen 15. And in this experiment, we made sure that we conduct experiments long enough that there's no more nitrogen 14 uh, ammonium produced, meaning that all the surface active nitrogen uh, 14 has been exchanged. Then the amount of nitrogen 14 ammonium produced is basically the amount of active sites we have, the total amount of active sites. And then this is a T, defined as T. And then uh, from the result I showed you before that uh, this catalyst does deactivate, which means that among the initial uh, active sites, only a fraction remains active at a steady state. Then how do we determine the density of that? We did that by basically running the same thing, but in nitrogen 14. In this case, only the steady state active site is able to exchange with nitrogen 14. And then by determining the amount of nitrogen 15 ammonium produced, we basically know the, this fraction. And as it turns out, it's about a quarter, okay? And then here, we also make sure that uh, we conduct experiments long enough, there's no more uh, nitrogen uh, 15 ammonium being produced after 24 hours. And then we define this as the SS, that is the steady state, right? And in order to make sure that our math makes sense or quantification makes sense, and then we did a consistency check, meaning that we electrochemically dissolved everything. And then we can determine the amount of nitrogen 15 here, right? This fraction of nitrogen 15 is, uh, belongs to those sites that are initially active and then deactivated, right? So this is defined as DA. And then this equation, this equality holds within uh, plus minus 15%, which I'm pretty happy about, depend, given how much peak deconvolution we have to do, okay? So this method works and then with this, we can determine the initial and the steady state turnover frequency. They are surprisingly similar, showing that it's not a very special group of sites that are active at a steady state. So the table message here is that the density of the initial and then steady state active sites can be determined by the ion isotopic exchange. And the open question is how to predict which type of surface nitrogen are active and stable? Because from the TOF, they are very similar. And you have probably noticed that in my talk, each section I posted or I included some open questions. And in a sense, those are calls for help from an experimentalist, right? Because a lot of those questions are very difficult to address experimentally. And this uh, leads me to the, uh, the slide. I hope I can find some sympathetic ears in this audience that as an author, as a reviewer of papers and proposals, and uh, as an editor, I've seen, I witnessed in the recent years a huge proliferation of publications with both experimental and computational results. However, personally, I don't believe this is an indication that close integration of theory and experiment uh, is the case. And in my mind that the integrated experimental and computational efforts are most effective when the materials used in experimental study and the model systems uh, used in computational study are 
at least correlated and then with some good justification. And then also each side provide verifiable predictions interpretations. All right. So with this, I'd like to thank, uh, I'd like to acknowledge all the people who are involved in this work, and I have uh, posted a picture in the slides as uh, I went through the uh, the different topics. And also, I would like to highlight or uh, give a shout out to all the collaborators: Professor Jing Guan Chen, uh, my colleague uh, Feng Jiao, uh, Yu Xian Yan, and uh, our dean Levi Thompson, and also in the CO CO two R work, we collaborated extensively with Professor Chi Lu at the Tsinghua University. And then the uh, major funding comes from the NSF and then the NLR work is supported by the Department of Energy. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to address any questions you have. Thank you. So thank you very much, Binjun, for that wonderful talk. Um, I'd like to keep you for myself. However, we already have, I think, seven questions. So we will just take them in order in the, for the next, okay. I guess, 20. So Should I, uh, I need to wow. find uh, Zoom. <laughs> okay, uh, but actually, we could read the questions to you, perhaps. Okay. Yeah. With, with if so, so the first question. Um, Am I? Uh, so could you tell me whether I'm still sharing slides? I couldn't. See. You are no longer sharing slides. It appears. Uh, okay. Yeah, but I think if you want to bring something back up, you can. Yeah. So. Uh, so let's start from the but front. But I didn't, I actually didn't uh, stop sharing, so. Oh, it says end of slideshow, click to exit. So you, you can actually turn back, I believe. Okay. Oh, okay. there you go. So now we see it. Okay. Um, so the first question, what is, so from Gong Zhang, what is the valence state of copper when copper oxygen exists? Mm -hmm. um, and then what are the sources from water or hydroxide? Uh, very, very interesting question. And then uh, I have to say that my honest answer is I don't know. And uh, this is because uh, the technique, um, the surface enhanced Raman is not a quantitative technique. So we cannot get information of let's say surface coverage of oxygen and then high, uh, hydroxy species. So this, these could be everywhere on the surface, or this could be a small fraction that happens to be enhanced by the, the shyness particles. So we honestly do not know the average, mm, the average uh, oxidation state. Mm -hmm. But the, we, the one thing we, I can say with some confidence is that in the surface enhanced IR study, uh, those bands are reasonably close to uh, the metallic copper like uh, conducted uh, under UHV ultra high vacuum conditions, those uh, should be mostly uh, metallic, so that the CO absorbs mostly on uh, the metallic copper sites. But at the same time, we don't know whether uh, the CO that's being consumed in, let's say, CC coupling or other chemistry, uh, whether they absorb on, let's say, the oxide or the oxidized sites and then just leave the surface so quickly that the, our spectroscopy couldn't capture. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a disappointing answer, but uh, this is an honest one. Yes, and yeah. great. So let's move on to Philippe Sauté, um, who has asked, Oxide-derived copper also has a different selectivity, more ethanol, less ethylene, and do you know why? Uh, well, this audience is sharp, and uh, I have to say that uh, I don't know why, and uh, actually this is one of the, <laughs> uh, the open questions I, uh, I included here. So uh, in our work, we prepared oxide-derived copper by the red, uh, thermal redox cycles and electrochemical redox cycles. And, and they do show slight difference in reactivity. And then they do show some difference in the in spectrum or in the CO absorption spectrum. And then this is basic. So our hypothesis, or at least my speculation, it has a lot to do with the microenvironment of the, C, the CU100-like sites. And then slight difference, let's say that uh, uh, if one is 10, uh, 10 one, one the other one's 11 one, one, that could 
tip the selectivity towards one thing or another. And again, I feel like these questions on this level, on this molecular level, is best addressed by theory to have a bottom-up understanding. Yes. And I'm not trying to put you on the spot, Karen. <laughs> well, well, maybe I can follow up and say that it's true that we do see these differences in selectivity, but if we were to try to relate it to electronic structure, it's actually very, very small differences. And I think the general trend is that you see more oxygenates at low overpotentials than um, hydrocarbons at high ones, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, I wonder if I could just comment, like you talk about um, the selectivity changes with oxide-derived mm -hmm. copper, but do you, do you observe any activity changes? Is the selectivity changes really coming from activity or is it coming from suppression mm -hmm. of other products? So I think this is a question that can be uh, better answered with the flow cell experiments. So th these are results from Dr. Feng Zhao's lab, right? And uh, um, so on the right-hand side will be the uh, total current density. So left-hand side is, uh, what is it, the, the Faraday efficiency. And then these do show differences. And uh, it, on the molecular level, the uh, interpretation from the flow cell experiments are a bit more involved, uh, more convoluted. But I would say that the uh, oxide drive copper, at least at a low over potential, uh, boosts both the, um, the rate and the selectivity for the C2 products. Okay. So this is our observation. And uh, whether these are correlated is a totally different question. And then uh, th this will be so at least I don't think I have a, a well-defined answer for you. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Do you want to talk about this? So let's just move on because there's quite a few. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So the next question is by uh, Sahil Garg and he asks, uh, in regard to cations and anions, what is your take on cations which can be specifically adsorbed? Uh, for example, uh, quaternary ammonium cations can simultaneous adsorption of both cations and anions have effect on product distribution? Uh, very good question. And then I do have a strong opinion on the specific absorption of cations. And in my opinion, my opinion, not, uh, not fact, right, is that they do not specifically absorb. But this has a lot to do with the definition of specific absorption. So in my dictionary, uh, the specific absorption means that it forms a chemical bond. Right. And uh, spectroscopically, we should observe a star tuning uh, effect uh, with those cations. And uh, uh, because most of the al alkaline metal cations are invisible to, uh, to IR, we did do in several cases that uh, with the uh, organic cations like uh, tetrametal ammonium, tetraethyl ammonium, and also the sodium chelated with, uh, with the crown ether. And then in none of those cases did we see any stock tuning. Uh, this indicates to me that they are outside this uh, our outer Helmholtz layer, so that they are, those bonds are not impacted by the, the electric field. And uh, I, uh, I'm aware of several uh, papers uh, claiming that there's specific absorption. And uh, uh, I guess, uh, I, from the, the results we have and then from other experimental uh, papers, uh, I, do not disagree, uh, I do not agree with that interpretation. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Great. So the next question is by Ying Chuan Tan, and he asks uh, for the formation and persistent presence of surface oxide species on copper, does it only occur in KOH or does it also occur in bicarbonate? Ah. Interesting question and excellent question. And uh, this is a, a piece of work we have been uh, drafting up. And then I can say that uh, we do not see as much, or we do not see uh, any indication as of those oxide species at a lower uh, pH. However, uh, it does have a strong pH dependence from the neutral to more alkaline conditions. Okay. On an RAT or an SHG scale? Uh, RG scale. Okay, interesting. Uh, so the next one is from Gaston Larazabel. Uh, 
Did you observe any cross-coupling between acetaldehyde and CO when no potential was applied to the electrode? Mm. I don't think so. And we did the control experiment and uh, uh, I don't think we, we saw any uh, C3 products. And this is one of the controls we did. Uh, let's see. Um, I believe this is a control we did and we did not see much uh, or any C3 product. And then this, so the NMR spectra was as soon as you add uh, acetaldehyde in, is very messy. However, we can uh, we can actually uh, identify the uh, the propanol quite easily. And then this is a uh, a slide I uh, I didn't show. And then so this is included in our paper that the the methyl group and then the hydroxy methyl groups uh, proton they are located at a very distinct locations from the rest. So that if there's cross coupling without potential, we would have seen them. We would have seen them and then we didn't. I see. Interesting. So, so I, I guess I will ask that perhaps we don't have time for any more extra questions because it's already, um, well, anyway, we were going to end at 4.45. So we only have seven minutes, so let's move on. Um, so. Joe Gautier, in your in situ Raman experiments that show oxygen containing species in oxide derived copper, even at reducing potentials, how long is the potential held before or during the IR experiment? Has your group tried holding a reducing potential for a long time? And if so, do you still see the oxygen containing species? Uh, very good question. So. I think that the, these experiments are on the order of maybe half an hour. Uh, I would say that each trip, like we do actually uh, the potential steps, right? And then sometimes we do several trips. And uh, I would say that uh, these features always, are always present when we conduct those experiments. And then maybe the total duration will be around, let's say, two, three hours. But uh, the, the duration, the time that it the surface exposed at negative 0.8, let's say the, the most negative potential uh, we tested, will be around maybe 20, 30 minutes, and then they do not show much difference. Okay. And uh, beyond that, we don't know. Okay. And uh, for IR, um, so the, this is very specific to the technique that the film we need to, uh, we need to prepare. Mm -hmm. Does, uh, uh, degrade, deteriorate over time on the order of maybe a couple of hours so that all those experiments are still uh, on the order of maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And then those catalysts are exposed to the reducing potential maybe on the order of uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. And uh, the intensity of the CO band does go down a little bit, but not as much. And then typically we maintain that, uh, we keep an eye on that. And if it goes, uh, the intensity deteriorates too much and then we repeat the experiment. So then next. Uh, Henrik Heenan asks, uh, could you maybe elaborate a bit on the reasons for discarding surface roughness as being responsible for different CO2 RR product, product distributions? Okay. So uh, as I mentioned that the surface roughness argument uh, is basically that uh, after redox cycle, we have higher surface area or surface roughness. And then at least I consider that the surface roughness should, or the higher surface area should increase the rate, but not the onset potential, right? And let's say that uh, if we have a less rough surface and then I can put a lot more catalyst in and so that we can boost the total surface area to the same as uh, of, let's say a uh, more rough, a rougher surface. And uh, if the surface roughness is the only factor or the surface area is the only factor, then we should be able to reproduce everything, right? At, by increasing the, the catalyst loading. And this is not a case where we observed because we observed the formation of the C2 product at a very much lower uh, oral potential on OD copper versus uh, other type of copper, regardless how much catalyst we put it in. Okay. 
So this is my primary argument. Uh, if there's a specific thing, uh, a question you want me to address, and, and I'm happy to discuss. If I may try to interpret Hendrix's question, Hendrix is, is from DTU. Um, I, I think we have tried plotting the oxide derived data, mm -hmm. normalized to ECSA. And when we mm -hmm. compare it to whatever polycrystalline data, mm -hmm. it doesn't look like the intrinsic activity towards C2 is particularly different. So, uh, is it, is it, it maybe is, by one order of magnitude? Maybe, maximum. It could be that other fabrication methods look, give different results. Mm -hmm. Right. So I cannot comment on that in the sense that, uh, so OD copper also comes in many different varieties, right? And yes. uh, at least uh, from what we have tested, that we can increase the amount of, uh, let's say, polycrystalline copper. And uh, uh, let's say the OD copper has a roughness factor of 10, we can increase the, count, uh, the surface area of the, the polycrystalline copper by a factor of 10. And then at the same potential, we do not see anything. Right, so, and uh, uh, let me go to the, the IR results <coughs> here. So I would say that this is more beyond uh, a factor of 10 here. So mm -hmm. for the chemically deposited copper, we basically see nothing and the NMR is below the detection limit. While for the OD copper, uh, they are, yeah. uh, it, it's quite a bit. And uh, let me go back to show you that <clears throat> the chemically deposited copper is not smooth in a sense because we also need the surface roughness to generate the surface enhancement effect. And then of course the OD copper is rougher, right? And then because of the, uh, the redox cycle. Yeah. So, at least from what we have seen, uh, OD copper, the reactivity of OD copper and the chemically deposited copper are qualitatively different. Yes, for sure there's a selectivity difference, yeah. And, and perhaps a, a, an enhancement in turnover frequency as well. Okay, thank you. Let's, do you wanna read a question? Yeah, okay. Um, can you study CO2 reduction on copper or oxide derived copper operando with high energy resolution fluorescence detection zanes for mechanistic studies? So we haven't done that, and, uh, but I have read uh, papers on that and especially on the, uh, on the speciation aspect. <clears throat> so uh, because the, a lot of the, the, the x-ray studies so in my mind, so in my interpretation is that it samples everything, right? It's, it doesn't really sample just the surface. And uh, then let's say that if the oxygen containing species is uh, the concentration or the density is relatively low, then it could be overwhelmed, right? Uh, but other than that, it does provide a lot of information that the, uh, the IR and the Raman couldn't. So I would say that the answer to that, this question is definitely yes, but there will be some caveats and because I haven't personally, I haven't done those experiments with CO2R, so I wouldn't have known them all the caveats. Yeah. Okay. Maybe just one, one more question. Yeah. So from Matthew Meyer, um, what might be the implication of the observed cation or anion effects when working in flow cells, namely gas diffusion electrodes, especially cells without liquid catholytes? Will the insights be transferable? Mm, I believe so. And then, so uh, in Sargent's work, when they use 10 molar uh, sodium hydroxide or potassium hydroxide, I, mean, uh, I don't remember. And then they do see much enhanced uh, reactivity, right? And uh, uh, in our work, we only uh, investigated the concentration of hydroxide from 0.1 molar to 1 molar, right? We don't see much uh, change. And then we infer that maybe higher concentration of hydroxide wouldn't really change that much either. And, but the cation concentration does have an impact. And then based on Sargent's results, I believe that as we increase the uh, ionic strength or the concentration of cations, it could have an impact. And then I believe that many groups have shown that as they increase the concentration of the electrolyte in the flow cells, uh, they do see a positive impact. So uh, based on what I know, I would say that the answer to this question is yes. Okay. 
Great. So I, I think with that, um, I apologize, we can't take all the questions that, that have been asked. Thank you so much, Binjun, for, for taking your, the time to do this for us. That was super enlightening. And I hope that when we next meet, we can discuss some more. So we will be in touch with you to uh, make some meaningful theoretical experimental works. So. All right, fantastic. Thanks for the opportunity. And thanks for all the questions. Yeah, thank you. Take thank care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.